Was there a moment though when you were whether you were a little leaguer or early in travel ball or something where you hit one five hundred feet and it was just <laughs> one of those? You, come on, you had to hit one. No, I I only had like four homers in high school and and <laughs> three of them were inside the Parkers, so I I definitely didn't have the power. <laughs> so I I just. I man, I just played the game the small ball way, and I th- feel like it definitely helped, like I said, mold me to be the player I am. Welcome to episode number 230 of the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media, and I've been looking forward to this chat. I've heard so many good things about him. We know that he's a stud, up-and-coming ball player, but I've also had people tell me he's like the best dude ever in a really nice organization. Royce Lewis, how's that for an introduction? Hey, that's a great introduction. I really appreciate it. I know my family and I pride ourselves in uh, in the being nice department, so I love that. That way, that way, you're number one on the list. I'm just telling I don't want to tell you who said this about you, but I was texting with him. I said, listen, uh, I've wanted to get him on for a while, wanted to talk to him. He just seems like an awesome kid, and he wrote back. He goes, Chris, he is the best I've ever worked with in wow. this organization. That's saying something, because y'all have had, like, Joe Mauer's like – Maybe like the nicest human being I've ever met. Oh, uh, uh, you definitely have that Minnesota nice thing going around here. That's for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, truth be told, we are taping this one week from opening day, which means that it's the start of the NCAA tournament. How mm. crazy is your clubhouse? Like everybody <laughs> watching those games and filling out brackets and stuff. Yeah. You know what? It started about two, three days ago. Like you said, right before the bracket started and, they got it going and they were trying to get people to, you know, uh, buy in. I think 20 bucks is little things, you know, um, but it was it was funny, man. It, it, they have a good time. I, I'm out of it. I don't know much about college. I'm not in. I know I got to be a better team guy, but I, I was in it the last four years and I just saw my donation go. So wait a second. Who cares if you're any good at it? Because what happens <laughs> if you end up picking a team and they go on this ridiculous run and then all of a sudden you have bragging rights for the rest of the year? That's true. My, I guess my stuff is fantasy football. I'm all in on fantasy football. Ah, uh-huh. okay. But who's but who's leading? There's always one guy who's in charge of collecting the sheets and wants to be like part of the NCAA selection committee. Who's that dude? That I would I would have to say it's Marcus, our our clubhouse manager. He actually does our away team clubhouse uh, during the season, but during the spring he's always around and. Uh, he's able to bring his daughter around, which is awesome. And uh, I love when all the kids come in, but yeah, he's definitely locked in on these brackets for sure. He's trying to get the guys in. Dude, it's always the clubbies. If the clubbies could get together and write a book, that would be a baseball bestseller, wouldn't it? Yes, absolutely. They have the best stories. They got uh knowledge of the game behind the scenes that no one else does. So it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so you're a fantasy football guy. Does that mean that you are the reigning champion of the league? Not not for the Twins, but for my other leagues, yes, I was a back-to-back champion. So I, I'm definitely – I'm always finishing top five. I love that. But we got to get that first place coming back. All right, so what does that mean? How many leagues are you in? Are you, you're not one of those guys who does eight leagues, are you? I was a couple of years ago. I had oh, seven. Royce. I had seven. Royce, <laughs> you can't do that because then you end up rooting for and against guys on the same day, and it gets too confusing. My brain explodes. It did. I, I actually agree with you completely. That's why the next year I went down on my head. I'm just going to do the three main ones. Like I'm, I'm in a dynasty league that we've been doing now for the last four years. And that's the one I was back to back champ. So I was proud of that league. So I'm going to keep doing that one. But, um, you know, I did the twins league this year because the guys were getting on me because I was talking a lot of, you know, bragging rights. And I tried mm-hmm. to wanted to wanted to win that one. I didn't I didn't do very well. But next year will be uh, a lot better. That's for so sure. The- the dynasty league is that like your boys from southern california with whom you grew up or was it is this baseball dudes baseball dudes uh played with the minor league system and then we also had some staff that uh eventually actually had moved on and moved different places but yeah we got guys all over the country man it's it makes it fun all right so who who was your best keeper in the dynasty league the one where you were like yeah i'm gonna hang on to him and he showed out for you ah see i had the first pick and i took patrick Mahomes. i i knew i couldn't go wrong there and i'm gonna have to stick with him he's He's my ride or die. I'm not going to – he's just QB1, leave him there. So he's but the guy. He's a, he's an owner of the Kansas City Royals in your own division. I mean, what, what are we doing here? Yeah, you know, he, he made good money and he was able to do some things. And unfortunately, it was in, it was in Kansas City. Uh, but, you know, I think if he was playing for, you know, the Rams, he couldn't be a part of one of the Dodgers, that's for sure. If he wanted to, I'm sure they'd want him, but – yeah, maybe maybe he's he would get that Magic Johnson piece where you're you're the face, 
you might not be contributing too much money, but your bank account is getting added. Nice. That's for sure. That's for yeah. sure. You did that piece. Yep. All right, more of our chat with Royce Lewis and Minnesota Twins coming your way. But first, I want to tell you about another podcast and a video series that you're not going to want to miss. And it actually is called The Deal, co-hosted by yet another former number one overall pick, Yankees legend Alex Rodriguez. Each and every week, A-Rod and Bloomberg reporter Jason Kelly, they speak with big-time athletes and entertainers and executives, the likes of Maria Sharapova, Michael Strahan, Derek Jeter, and oh so much more. So what does the deal do? It takes you behind the scenes into the world of sports, media, and entertainment. It dives into the wins and losses and the lessons learned along the way. And A-Rod's got plenty of lessons. As I mentioned, he was the number one overall pick of the draft. He ended up being the highest paid player in the game. He ended up getting traded to the New York Yankees. He ended up finally winning a ring after up and down times with the fans. He ended up being suspended. He ended up working his way back into the good graces of baseball. So he has seen the highs, he has seen some lows, and he has plenty of lessons to tell you all about. And A-Rod's a great storyteller. It's coming your way from Bloomberg Podcast, Bloomberg Originals. You can listen to The Deal on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. So this is amazing. You are about to have your first opening day, which is amazing because you've been on the radar for so long. Are you nervous, excited? Where are your emotions going into this? Very excited. Very excited. Definitely not nervous. Uh, just because I, I'm really excited to start a year off healthy. Uh, it's been, you know, obviously four years since 2019, really, uh, due to COVID and ACL injuries that are freak injuries. And uh, I'm ready to get the the media monkey off my back where everyone likes to label people. And uh, I feel like they're starting to label me as like an injury guy. And that's just when you have a freak injury, I don't know how you do that. But um that's okay with me. So I'm I'm just excited to play as much as I can and be available for Rocco and the staff. And uh, it starts with opening day. So that's why I'm excited. Does that piss you off that you're labeled that way? I think more so for other guys. Cause it's like, do you think they want to get hurt? You know, ideally no, uh, no one wants to ever get hurt, but that's part of the game. And health is a big attribute. I think that might be like the sixth tool, honestly, to be honest, like Marcus Simeon, what he does is very special to play 162 games um, and then some in spring training and postseason. So um, I just talked with him a little bit and learned a little bit from him. And uh, I feel like since I've had come back from those ACLs, I've been feeling great and it's only been progressively getting better. So um, it, the label doesn't make me mad. It just is silly to me. I always just laugh like that they go off of stuff that why don't you try running into a wall at 28 miles an hour and see what happens? You know what I mean? Hard pass, by the way. Thank you. No, <laughs> no. What did Marcus tell you that stuck with you the most? That his his pregame routine of what he does every day to get ready before, even if it's just, hey, I'm going to take early work ground balls. He has this routine that he's able to do that he found was best for him. And he just suggested, you know, finding what's best for you and your body to get it ready to go um, to get yourself loose for those moments so that you're not, you know, dealing with a, an ailment the next day from something that was 15 minutes worth of work. Uh, you're just going for quality there. So, you know, always be ready no matter what the, hey, I'm just going to hit in the cage as well. Just because you're young and you can go hit in the cages without getting warmed up, kind of just start getting your body ready. So primes you for when you're, what did he say, like 34 plus when you're trying to play into your late 30s. And I said, yeah, that that's what I want to do. So um, I know you don't want to focus on the injuries, but it is part of your journey. Yeah. And and one thing we really do on this show is talk about how you deal with adversity because there's no sport where you're going to deal with failure or in your case, physical hurdles more so mm -hmm. than baseball. So I'm curious, not about the first ACL that happens, but when you come back and you have a second one, was there a little, whoa, me like what is going on here? Yeah, I was definitely like down on myself and a little upset at just the situation of like, like why me type thing. And you know, what could I have done different? I looked at it. I, the only thing I could have done differently was like, I guess not try, which I've never done on a baseball field before. And so it didn't make sense. You know, I, I still recorded the out. That's what I always like to, you know, say is like, I was just playing the game the way I knew it. It just catch the ball. And so, uh, you know, when you have very little experience out there in center field and, you know, I see a ball coming, I'm going to go chase after it. That's just what I do. You know, that's how I play the game. I play hard and, um, I was blessed enough to be fast enough to do those kind of things. And uh, I was just so happy that, you know, I had an opportunity to play in the big leagues, wherever that may be. And 
And now this year it looks like it's going to be third, but uh, you know, based off the injuries, I feel like uh, it, at first it definitely was a woe me moment and I was very upset with life and I felt like baseball was my everything. And I learned how to, you know, become a better person because of that injury. And uh, I took that obstacle and used it to uh, better myself and advance my career. I mean, it's so mature, but you're a guy in your early 20s still. How did you get past it? Did you rely on people? Was it family members? Was it a friend that you could confide in and be like, dude, today is a, is a real struggle for me? Yeah, it was uh, the total complete support of everybody, my friends, my family, uh, my agency, the twins. Um, it just seriously felt like a, a great team effort on all aspects. And some days it was I need to talk to the twins, you know, PTs and staff and and ATs and let them know how I'm feeling and where I'm at mentally. Uh, then it was also, you know, talking with my family, of course, like my mom or my dad and just letting them know where I was at and uh, knowing that they're always there for you. And, and it just helped that I had all that support system and uh, they really did take care of me. And clearly it put me on a path to success. And, and now I'm feeling the benefits of that. And I'm really excited. All right. More of the show is coming your way, but I need to talk to you about something really important. Your underwear, namely Tommy John second skin underwear. What you put in your pants can make or break your day. And the luxurious support of Second Skin guarantees everything. And I'm talking about everything will go super smooth. Because when you wear Tommy John, you're much more comfortable. So that means you can do everything in your life better. Tommy John's stylish and soft Second Skin underwear has dozens of comfort innovations, like a supportive contour pouch, breathable, lightweight, moisture-wicking fabric that's four times the stretch of competing brands, and with over 20 million pairs sold and thousands of five-star reviews, guys everywhere simply love their Tommy John. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. When you put it on, they talk about it being breathable. What does that mean? It means on a hot, steamy day, you don't get swamp butt. And for those of us that have childbearing hips, it gives us the freedom to expand and not worry about what we're showing back there. It is oh so important. So right now, go get 25% off site-wide right now at TommyJohn.com slash talking. That's right, talking. You'll save 25% for a limited time at TommyJohn.com slash talking. See the site for details. Happy wearing. You'll feel oh so much better south of the equator. You were the first pick in the draft out of high school, out of Jay Sarah, which is a power down in, in Southern California. I'm always curious, when you're, when you're the best guy coming out of high school, when were you the best kid? Like, were you the best player at five years old? Was it eight years old? Was it a, When did it happen for you? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't I never thought of myself as like the best player. I just felt like I was on the best team. And so it always helped that I had great players around me, similar to the support that I had through, you know, ACL uh, injuries or whatever it may be. Uh, when you fight through adversity with with someone else by your side, it definitely helps and takes some of that pressure off of you yourself. And so for me, I always just focused on my teammates and and how we're going to win today. And I never focused on like me and myself and I. Uh, I feel like when anyone does that, they make themselves worse. Just like going into a tryout. The best advice I always give kids is when you go to a tryout, just have fun and be in the present moment and enjoy the people you're playing with. And because some of these guys will go on to the next level and hopefully you're one of those guys. But when you don't focus on yourself and you focus on others, uh, it makes the world a better place for one on the off the field part. But on the field, it makes you a better player at the end of the day. So uh, that's what I tend to do. And that's why I'm most looking forward to opening day. We got all of our guys, for the most part, very healthy. And we're looking to you know put on a show uh, with each other and have fun doing it. I love that. I love that response. But you were the best. Like, let's <laughs> let's just, let's just have fun here. You were the best. So at what point did you realize, like, I am a little different. Like, I could go do this for a living. It had to have itch at some point. I feel like uh, my junior year, it felt like, okay, I'm going to get to the next level of college when I had, you know, UCLA, uh, Vanderbilt, ASU, UC Irvine, which I ended up actually committing to. Um, all these colleges kind of reaching out, and I was very excited and, um, you know, getting some coll collegiate offers. Um, it definitely helped my, you know, baseball knowledge of myself in that, like, hey, I'm pretty good at this game and I'm having fun and uh, I'd love to keep doing this like long term. And I, my goal was always like, how do I be like, a, you know, Bryce Harper or 
just any top 10 pick. That was my goal. I wanted to be a top 10 pick. So um, that was my focus. And when I got to high school, I worked as hard as I could every day. And again, listen to my coaches and they helped shape me to be the player I am today. And, and it's definitely paid off. And so I couldn't thank them enough, but definitely probably my junior year is when I started noticing like, Hey, I could do this long term. Was there a moment though, when you were, whether you were a little leaguer or early in travel ball or something where you hit one 500 feet and it was just <laughs> one of those, you, come on, you had to hit one. No, I, I only had like four homers in high school and, and three of them were inside the Parkers. So I, I definitely didn't have the power. <laughs> so I, I just, I, man, I just played the game the small ball way. And I th- feel like it definitely helped, like I said, mold me to be the player I am because I play at all facets of the game. I steal bases. Uh, I'll bun on you. We'll do hit and runs. Uh, that's just how I grew up. That's how I played the game the old fashioned way. Um, so this new way of homers or strikeouts and being okay with striking out is different to me, but uh, you know, we'll be able to thrive in it as well. We'll make it happen. So you're telling me this whole grand slam thing wasn't something you concocted when you were eight years old and just running around the bases and then going and get a burger and fries with your boys afterward. Yeah, def- definitely not. You know, that those days were awesome. I'll tell you that we, we definitely try to hit home runs when we play wiffle ball in the backyard or, or in the front yard, try to hit over the house type deal. Um, and I love mimicking some of those stances like Ichiro Suzuki or King Griffey Jr. From the left side. I used to actually try to switch hits. So that was my thing is like, can I hit lefty? Because I was trying to play the aspect of like, hey, bunt, steal, hit and run um, and do from the left side as as a fast guy. I felt like that was an easier game if you're on the left side of the plate. And uh, it didn't end up working out. I said, there's way too many righties, Dad. I don't want to do this anymore. So I went to the right side and just started to do my thing. And uh, I think it worked out pretty good. Did you go hat backward when you were a Griff? I did it only when we play wiffle ball on the field. I never, I try not to do the hat backward thing. I try to be as professional as possible. That's fine. But just since we're on a stupid little podcast, just go hat back just for a second. Let me just see what you look like. Let me just see how you go. Oh, no, yeah. no dude, you I can pull that. that off easy. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a huge, like have fun with the game, but I know that there's also some old school aspects of like, you know, guys that my mentors that are talking about like, Hey man, respect the game. And so um, I do a little bit of both. All right. If you were more comfortable with the bill forward, do, do, you do you. I don't want to tell you what. I just wanted to see what it looked like. So you do whatever's comfortable here. That's we'll, where we're... We'll, we'll be professional. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be normal here. Yeah. Button it up, Lewis, for God's yeah. sakes. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> um, so you, you're going to be that guy who some kids played against in high school and be like, I played against Royce Lewis. Like we always have one. For me, it was a kid named OJ McDuffie. Wow. He went to our rival high school. We went to a couple of, uh, uh, snot nosed private schools in the suburban Cleveland area. Now he ended up being a first round pick of the Miami Dolphins, but he was a stud basketball player, stud baseball player. And in Cleveland, he would have home games where he was the DH and in between at bats would run track events. Wow. So he, yeah, it was great. They'd schedule the whole thing. It was, they totally pulled the wool over everybody's eyes and he was competing in two events in a day. It was crazy. Who was the best player you went against in Southern California where you played against? And he was like, that dude, all right. That's a really great question. I, I was blessed enough to play from a young age. I used to play against Hagen Danner, Nick Prado uh, in Little League. And when they won the World Little League World Series, we actually lost to them in San Bernardino right before we go to the next step. And uh, we were bummed out, man. That, that was the first time I definitely was crying, you know, in, in one of those events where I was competitive. And I thought we had it as a team, but we lost. But um, I would have to say Hunter Green, you know, from 14, 15, you, mm-hmm. you know, doing the USA baseball stuff and learning that he was from L.A. County area and actually right around the corner from my grandparents and where my uncle live. And so I was like, oh, he's going to Notre Dame High School. And I never got the chance to actually play against him when he pitched. But we played against each other, and we got to play with each other on the USA stuff and some of the Under Armour All-American game, the Perfect Game All-American game. But he definitely stood out, man. He was like the Otani of America, not mm-hmm. Japan. So it was it was impressive, and I wish that they the Reds let him stick it out hitting-wise because he he had some pop, man. He hit, he hit it 500 feet, that's for sure. Now, for people that don't, don't know, uh, Notre Dame, it's in Sherman Oaks, California, huge school. Giancarlo Stanton went there, a bunch of other guys as well. Did you ever square off against each other in high school? No, we I I faced him maybe one at bat uh, when we used wood bat in uh, it was like a game at Cal State Fullerton and I couldn't tell you the event I apologize but it was like a Southern California type event right. where they 
showcase all these all-stars per high school team. You get two guys from your high school and you go over there and uh, I faced them then and I popped out to left center. So uh, didn't even drive it. Just get, get you in on the, he got, he got me, he jammed me. You know, he had a little run on it, 96 or 99 probably. I don't even remember the VLO because I don't think we had VLO going on that scoreboard at that point. It was a high school game. They didn't want to show it. So um, it was probably 100 for all I know. So you probably haven't faced him in the show yet, have you? You know what? I faced him on a rehab. He was rehabbing. I was uh, rehabbing uh, last year in AAA, and we were in St. Paul. And uh, we actually ate dinner after and everything. Uh, so we were really good buddies and – um man i just i was happy that he was able to sign a nice extension and um man he's making the dream come true man he's doing it so well hold on a second please tell me that he picked up the tab because he already had the extension no no he he's in our city you know i got i got the tab and and i oh. took him out to the cool place that i liked free house so um you know it was the only place that stays open pretty late after a game like that so uh we went to have some really good brussels sprouts at the goat cheese you know way to so keep it classy was- Way to keep it yeah, classy, absolutely. man. Absolutely, yeah. I, I got to tell you, man, that's pretty good for your part because I would have been like, listen, when I sign the extension, <laughs> then I'll treat you. But right now, I saw that extension you got. Here's here's the check. That's so funny. No, I, I just, you know what? I like to do things uh, the right way as best I can. Uh, and I feel like when you come to our city and I'm taking you somewhere and I ask you to go to dinner, like I'm going to take care of you. And, and he's someone that's been helping me throughout my career, you know, as well, just being a friend to talk to and, uh, you know, get some knowledge from about the game and how where he's at, where I'm at, and just someone to have fun with, you know. So I'm definitely going to help take care of the people that help take care of me. Nice. Must be a, a twins third baseman thing because that's the way Ploof is <laughs> when he goes out to dinner. Boy, oh boy, it's officially time for fans to head to the ballpark and root for their home team as the baseball season gets underway. Get in on the action early this season with our partners at DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, all new customers who bet five bucks will get $150 in bonus bets instantly. And don't forget to use our code ROSE. So download DraftKings Sportsbook app now, and new customers use promo code ROSE and bet five bucks on any wager and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code ROSE only at the DraftKings Sportsbook. The crown is yours. Now, you got to let me in on the secret. I don't know if you've been on a lot of planes with Ploof because he started doing the whole twins broadcast thing. Yep, yep. Does he still act like he's one of the boys on the plane? Oh, I think not only on the plane, just everywhere, man. He's he's Mr. Cool, Mr. Swaggy, you know? <laughs> he's always walking around and got that good smile on him, and he's always wearing the nice shades. I always tell him, I'm like, man, you look good, man. He always looks good, and he's just, you know, he takes it, you know, humbly, but he definitely knows. He knows it. Wait a second. I was with you until the last comment, that he takes it humbly? You yeah, sure? yeah. Yeah, you know, he smiles it off, but I could tell he knows that he's he's got the swagger and um it's just he's just a funny guy, man. And he actually gave me some third base tips too. So it was actually fun that he goes on those those trips with us. And you you listen to them? I did, yeah. This guy played in the big leagues for a while. I'm gonna listen to anybody that has done that. <laughs> Especially at third base. Third base was something new to me. I know I played three years in high school there, but uh it's a lot different when you have high school bats or if you have Giancarlo Stanton or Vlad Guerrero Jr. hitting the ball at you. So um, I had to learn how to how to get back quick on the ball. Yeah. Please tell me, like, a normal human being, we get scared shitless on stuff like that. Is there a little bit like you're like, oh, God, I'm really close to home plate? Oh, 100%. I'm like, why are we playing this far in? What are we doing? You know, this guy's going to kill me if he hits a hot line drive and I don't see it the right way, you know. But um, I feel like after the play is over, I look up at the video board. Now they put all the exit velocities right. everywhere. And I remember getting one. I made a, a decent play on Randy Rosenreina. Hit it 112 uh, down the line, and I got it. And I felt like it was a routine play in my head because now we've seen so many repetitions of 100-plus mile an hour, and, you know, they do a good job of us putting a machine and just letting it rip out there um, just so we get that good look and good practice. But, um, you know, I'm getting used to it now, but still you look up, you're like, wow, I can't believe that just happened. This guy just crushed that ball. Do you ever – I mean, I imagine sometimes it hits you right on the palm, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> more more than I'd like it to. That's for sure. I wear my glove a little bit off my the heel of my hand, too. So, mm-hmm. like, if you catch it right here, you're getting more hand than glove. And I've had so many times where it's just red for a while. And you're like, what? What just happened, man? Why do I do this? I signed up for this, you know? But and then, then you go up to hit and you're like, all right, now I'm doing the damage. So it makes it a lot more fun. So where are you allowed to stand when Aaron Judge comes up? 
like short left. Man, I you know what? He's been either injured or I never played the Yankees or oh, I've been okay. injured. So um I think I'm probably gonna be close to the grass. I know we can't go on the grass anymore. That was the rules. So I think that rule is honestly very dangerous for some people. Like I was myself. gonna say, you know, <laughs> like whoever makes that rule does not understand when there's a six foot eight, two hundred and seventy five pound monster climbing into the right hand handed batter's box like let's clean it up a little bit here yeah i felt like that rule was made for the second baseman playing right field and so what what they should have done was just said hey you can go on the grass as long as you're within three to five feet of the dirt i think that would have been more realistic but um i'm not the guy making the rules because it makes too much sense if it makes sense it's not baseball that's what i always say (laughs) (laughs) i love it you are so wise beyond your years we could make you commissioner though once you're done playing if you want to Hey, uh, I don't know if I'd like that, but I definitely would be involved in baseball somewhere. That's for sure. Well, you already have a leadership role. You are the godfather of uh, one of your coach's children, correct? Yeah, my high school coach, Brett K. Yeah, his son, Caden K. And I used to grow up playing around, obviously, you know, in high school and playing with Brody K, his oldest. So um, we have a good connection still. And uh, I try to stay in touch as much as I can. I know he's busy. I'm busy. But uh, those guys, man, they're growing up fast. That's for sure. Now, I be- so there's an older brother, right? Yep. And I believe that somebody else is also the godfather of that. Do you know who that is? Yeah, Austin Hedges is the godfather of the older brother. So both both first rounders out of our high school, you know, we got we got the uh, the kids under control. Well, here's the deal. I don't know if you know this or not, but Austin Hedges is a – co-host of the Chris Rose rotation. So he joins us every four, five, six weeks throughout the season. That's awesome. You guys, although a wonderful human being, you guys could not be more polar opposites. So (laughs) when these kids end up as two totally different children, it's really going to be because of the way the Godfather's act. I'm just telling you. It'll be our fault. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, man, Austin's a great guy, man. He's so funny. And uh, next time you have him on, you'll have to remind him of that when he was smiling and thrown to me in the season last year, we were beating up on uh, Texas at our place, and he came in to throw. And man, he got me out. And as soon as I popped up, he goes, he just starts busting out laughing. And he said something I couldn't hear him, but it had to have been something like "I got you" or something, because I was just like, man, I knew he was gonna have bragging rights. And now he's got that until we break the, you know, breaks off of Cleveland, and then he'll come in to throw. Then I gotta get him again. That's pretty good. Um, there's. If the kid is going to follow in his godfather's footsteps, that older kid is never going to wear a shirt. Like that's Hedge's calling card. Like th- yeah. that's what he does, and he doesn't care. He's got he doesn't have any children. He's already got a dad bod. This yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, man. man. Uh, I'm curious if there is a um, a thing that happens in baseball because there's only one guy who gets picked first every year in the draft. So it's like you, Harper, Correa. Mickey Moniak. There's not that many guys in the league who can kind of, you can look at each other and you're like, yep. Like it's almost like the Heisman trophy winners. Like they know it's, there's only one a year. So is yeah. there some sort of discussion you've had either with a Correa or a Harper or somebody else who has been in the position that you have been in? No, I, I, I can't say that I have, but that definitely sounds cool to have like a little, like yes. a one team club or something. That'd be cool. That'd be like a Heisman Trophy Club, I like. Well, that. they've we got the they've got the Heisman House, right, where they've got the the whole thing. Why don't yeah. we get the the overall number one baseball picks all to live in a house together for a commercial shoot? I'm trying to get it's a little extra dough in your pocket. That would be a genius idea, and I think that you just came up with something that we need to make happen. That that's a great idea. I love that, and just to build off some knowledge from each other too, just toss it off the walls in that house, and then maybe do a little podcast or something, little little interviews with. With each guy, that'd be great. That's a great idea. See, I'm I'm on to something. And just like the fun Heisman House commercials, you bring back the old guys. So you have Griff in there. Yeah. You know, maybe you let uh, Chipper Jones swing by, and then oh, you yeah. have you have some of those guys who like never made it, but were the first overall pick. Like there was a guy named Brian Taylor who never threw a pitch for the Yankees because he got in a bar fight and he ruined his shoulder. You know, oh. and you have little cameos by those guys. Like we could, I mean, I, you and I are putting together a great show here. Yeah, we are. I would I would love that. And we could definitely, you know, make some some weird jokes about like not make it. Who are you? And then, uh, yeah, I got a whole commercial in my head. I'm already ready. I like this. I love it. I love yeah. who I, I love it. You walking up to somebody and saying, who are you? <laughs> I am in. 
I am a little harsh. It might not have to be me, but we got the ideas written down. The producers are ready. You you could be the executive producer on that. See, so you're the uh, you're the lead writer that wants to hide behind the zinger. You just don't want to say it because you're too nice. But you would like to write the "Who are you?" line for somebody. Yeah, it, it would have to go to someone else. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I'm digging that. So speaking of number one overall picks, different sport here. Cam has got his own podcast. I want you to listen to this, and then I want you to react to it. Per capita, the state of Georgia is the most athletic state. California, somebody going to say California. California. Cool. Somebody going to say Florida, too. But per, I mean, dog, we're talking about a state that's not that big. Mm-hmm. California, you got so much space. What do you think? Wow. I, you know what, that, that is, um, that's tough for me. I, I would even put Texas over Georgia, but I put California over to everybody just because I've, I mean, a little bit of bias, but honestly, just cause you see it, when you see it, you get to realize like how many sports we have so many in, you know, just the athletes in general, basketball, baseball, football, soccer. I feel like they're all really dominant out in California to where it's like, you know, you think of Texas is more football, Georgia. You want to say it's baseball, football, probably a mix, basketball too. But I feel like, yeah, California. I don't know. Is there even a question? Around sports, I, it's not a question. I, I don't think. I mean, just look at the athletes that come out of California. I know. His whole point is, is that you got so you know millions and millions of more athletes available. So what he's saying is, per capita, it's Georgia. With it is a great athlete. You might have a point. State. Yeah, you might have a point there. I can yeah. see that. I lived there for three years um, very early in my career. I'm from Ohio. We are not the greatest athletic state ever. I've raised two sons out here, and I have seen the competition, and it is top-notch. The, the baseball's insane. The The way kids throw the ball now at age 14, I'm like, we didn't see that stuff like from seniors in high school. Now you see right. eighth graders that are just pounding the zone, throwing like, 88 you're like what is going on here dude absolutely were, were you ever a pitcher as a kid hi i threw a little bit but not nothing crazy you know we just try to keep it fastball change up i barely threw curveballs and and when my fastball wasn't on or my change up wasn't on it was just a one pitch guy so it definitely didn't work out for me in my favor did you ever try and throw it as hard as you could of course, yeah, but when you're 10, you're only throwing, I don't know, 70 poo, something like that. So it wasn't it wasn't anything special. I, I don't even think I could top 85 at this point in my career. It's just it. pitching is a different animal. I have very much respect for those guys and their arms. I don't know how they do it. Even though it's every five days, it's still 100 pitches or whatever it may be. To be throwing 95 late into the, you know, 90 pitches, 80 pitches plus, it's impressive. It's definitely impressive. By the way, Hedges was not throwing 70 poo. He was throwing like 50 poo. Yeah. Oh, he was throwing maybe even 40 or 30. <laughs> he was lobbing that thing. It was had a big loop too. He was funny, man. Yeah. He he hates the idea of why he's in the game, you know, because his team's getting the break speed off of him. But there's there's a part of him that actually digs it because he wants to have like he did it against his old team in Cleveland when he was with Texas. Yep. And he loved being able to look in that other dugout. And say, no matter where we go the rest of our respective careers, I own you. He I loved you. that aspect. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You could tell some guys definitely love that. Um, and Carlos was joking around with, uh, we had Nick Gordon. And he was doing that for us whenever we were kind of getting beat on, unfortunately. And those those days are going to happen, right? But when we had it, Nick Gordon would come in and kind of, you know, Unfortunately, he was feeding some BP. I, he used to pitch in his day, and he threw he threw hard, and he was good. Hmm. So I was hoping he would kind of ramp it up a little bit and get it going. But he was lobbing it in there just like he was told to do, and and he was getting crushed on a little bit. He would double here, single here, whatever. Um, and Carlos went up to him one day and said, hey, man, you know that that ruins your war, right? And then he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, I'm never doing that again. I'm never do- I'm going to strike him out next time. I'm like, yeah, you should try. Like, it's so funny. So uh, – it's just funny because the dialogue between players behind the scenes is so like we're just normal people, man, and we we think and do the same stuff, and we we have a lot of fun. So that's good. Uh, one thing is not normal is throwing the ball 103 miles an hour like your closer does, and hopefully he checks out okay soon and gets back on the diamond. But when Durant comes in the game at Target Field, and they turn it into this nightclub with like fire breathing dragons and music to the nines. 
Yes. Like the first time you were standing on the field when this happened, were you like, what in the heck is going on here? Oh, it, not what the heck is going on, but every single time we go out there, I think all of us love the show. We love it. I I look up at the stands and they got their iPhones, flashlights going and um, people get into it, man. And, and Duran deserves it. He throws so hard. His splinker splitter deal his nasty and his curveball, I think, might be honestly his best pitch. Uh, whenever I face him in the lives, I, I don't know what what's happening. It's like looks like a fastball all the way, and all of a sudden it just drops at the table. So it's pretty impressive. Do you have to time it because you can't be throwing the ball across the diamond to your first baseman? All of a sudden the lights come down because you're going to end up with a first <laughs> baseman with no teeth. Yeah, we talked about that. We're like we're just going to sit and all watch, and then you know Carlos he he'll come out and be like, all right, let's throw because the lights they tend to change really quickly. By the time that we actually get out there to our positions, we're fine to throw. But, yeah, it is tough to, like, hey, I'm not going to throw it all the way across. And at the time, Donovan Solano, I'm like, I can't even see Donnie from here. So, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. Am I going to throw this or what? So we just wait till the lights come on. Um, Byron Buxton is a guy that we're also hoping has good health in 2024. We saw him here in the exhibition season. He hit a triple. And it was one of those games I don't think that was broadcast. So we got kind of a weird camera angle. Yeah. Now, were you here when he literally took like a Sunday stroll and still made it to third base with no problem? Uh, oh, yeah, I was at the game and that's what I was telling people. I'm like, he came up to me, too, and said, like, oh, man, if I was running, you know, that's I'm standing up at home. I'm like, yeah, I know, because he, he, he's that guy, man. He can fly with the best of them. And I'm so happy to see him doing his thing again, healthy, like you talked about. I think more so than the fans, even the players on our team, we know how important he is to us. Uh, what a leader he could be for us. And the fact that he brings that speed and all these aspects to, I mean, he's an MVP player if he's healthy. I feel like, you know, it's similar. Him and Mike Trout are very similar to me, except for Byron has the speed edge for sure. And it's going to be impressive to watch this year. I'm really excited to have a front row vision of that. Yeah, no question. Before we let you go, there was an article I saw that said, even though you are a stud baseball player, you might be an even better bowler. What in the Mookie bets is this all about? Is this accurate or is that just something I found on the internet? It, you know what? It must be something you found on the internet. I, I don't go very much anymore. I used to go a lot, of, uh, a lot off quite often, honestly. And, and we had, we had a lot of fun and I'd bowl pretty good, but not like Mookie, man. Mookie, Mookie's the best athlete in the game. That's for sure. Bowling three hundreds. I've never bowled a 300. My best game was like a two thirty four. Um, so I'd say I'm good. You know, you take me out like one of those like random dates, cheap dates where we're going to go bowling. I'm, I'm going to have a good time and probably show off a little bit, but I'm definitely not put, putting up Mookie Betts numbers. That's for sure. So you can spin, you can cut the ball any way you want. You can do all that stuff. I, you know what? I'm very straightforward. I just go as hard as I can down the middle, try to hit that, that first and second pin right in the, in the between there and just throw it as hard as I can and let it just plow, you know, go everywhere. So you're strictly throwing four seamers down there. Yeah, sometimes two seamers, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just our, I got it. Oh yeah. How yes. do, do you have your own ball? I do. Our family has our own set of balls, and uh, my dad got it for us for Christmas, custom set of balls. So uh, I have a twelve pounder, or twelve and a half pounder. My sister's got a ten and a half pounder. My mom the same, and my dad's got a. I think he's a thirteen pounder. He's got the biggest one. So wait a second. You said you have a twelve pounder and a twelve and a half pounder. Is that just depending on how you're feeling that day or how much wax is that? What what's the difference? No, they're, they're, it's the same ball. I, I think it actually is just twelve and a half pound. It's just one ball. Oh, but, okay. Uh, it's man. It's got my favorite colors. It's like a oh. kind of like high school theme. So it's like black, gold, and red. Uh, and it, it definitely is created for spin. But I don't know how to spin it, so I got to work on that. Yeah, I say you start. You get um. I would get uh, a bowling ball with like the rest of the infielders faces on it. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. like you get one with Correa's face. You all go out on a nice night somewhere and go to a bowling alley. And then yeah, wouldn't it be great to see Royce Lewis's face right on a bowling ball? I think it'd be, it'd be awesome. You know, if you get the twins on a bowling ball, maybe that's something we can auction off this year too. And a lot, especially in Minnesota, you know, not much to do in the winter, but going to a bowling alley would be one of them. I would think so. All right, last thing. I know you're busy. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on it. As a Southern California kid, the first time you ever played in the cold, were you like, I really want to go home? I, You know what? I didn't say I want to go home, but I was like, 
why are they letting us do this? Or why are they making us do this? This is this shouldn't this isn't baseball. You know, that that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, I've never played below 35 in my life. And now we're playing at what they say feels like negative 12 and in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. I, don't, I think it was Peoria. And I was like, what's going on here? And this is in low A. We're playing while it's snowing. And I'm like, this is not baseball, not, not the baseball I knew. So for me, it was kind of just like, how do I – you know, sacrifice, but like stay healthy and get through these, these like two months. Cause in Minnesota, I don't know how it snows and so cold for eight months of the year. It's impossible to me. I've never heard of it, um, but it happens. And so, I mean, we played last year, it was snowing. My parents came out for my birthday, right. And it was in June, June 5th, my birthday, it came out in June and early June, we have snow and we're playing in 12 degrees in St. Paul on the water. So you have this brisk breeze and my mom and grandparents are like, you know, I'm looking up in the in the stands and they are all cuddled up with the hoods. And I'm like, this is exactly what I'm thinking. Like, I, and they're like, how do you play? I said, I don't know. I'm going to be honest. We have heat warmers, but they don't do anything because I can't feel my hands already. My ears are gone. So if you're yelling something to me, coach, I can't hear you. It's like th this thing, it shouldn't be, you know, a state where we probably should have a dome, but we don't. So I think going deep into the playoffs is going to be a challenge for not only us, but the other team, too. It, it's going to be. Very interesting. It might be like a Kansas City Chiefs versus whoever they just played Miami, Miami. Dolphins, negative three, <laughs> and have some fans get some hypothermia. We got to be careful. You're saying this happened in June? Yeah, early June, like late May, early June. My they came out for my birthday, and it was snowing, and we were like, I said, this is really what Minnesota is about. You know what I mean? So now they had no snow in the in the winter. So now I'm like, does that mean extra snow in the spring? I don't know what's going to happen. Let me tell you something. I love my kids. Not that much. Like, I'll see it. <laughs> you know what? I'll see it a nice warm dinner after the game, and we'll go celebrate your birthday. I've seen you play thousands and thousands and thousands of games. I'm sitting this one out. Yeah, yeah. I. You know what? It it definitely is a diff different experience, and you got to be careful. Make sure you hit the barrel, because if you miss the barrel, your hands are blown up for a, at least two innings, and uh, it's a different experience. So it's something you have to uh, get used to, that's for sure. Well, I got to tell you, I enjoyed this so much. Uh, you're an easy kid to root for. Stay healthy. Go do amazing things, except for those 13 games a year against my little Cleveland Guardians. The rest of the year, go knock yourself silly in the other 149 games. Um, your pleasure, your joy, your class act. And uh, I cannot wait to see where this rocket ship takes you, my man. This is awesome. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And uh, I really enjoyed this interview, man. I, 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 it didn't even feel like an interview. It just felt like we were hanging out. So I appreciate it. Yeah, that's what we do. It's, it's the, the young kid and the old man. We can, we can do it as much <laughs> as you want. Tell all the good people up there in Minneapolis we say hello and have a great start to your 2024 season, Royce. Thank you, man. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. So for Roy, Royce Lewis and our amazing producer, Robbie Chiracco, I am Chris Rose. We will see you next time here on the Chris Rose Rotation, a production of John Boy Media.